Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, today I would like to spend some time for something which is called the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. Such a great name. Well, actually the first Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. Even greater. Um, well, um, this lecture is part of the course of advanced mathematics for um, high school students. It's presented on unizor.com. Um, together with every lecture, there is a very detailed notes, and uh, uh, in some cases there are exams for you to basically uh, control how you study the subject. All right, so now let me start with um, a couple of things, uh, basically a reminder. First of all, a reminder of what is um, the definite integral. We define it as limit of sum of these expressions, where number of intervals goes to infinity, and uh, all intervals which we are dividing segment A B uh, into are shrinking to null intervals. So that's the definition. Now, graphically, I would like to remind you that integral is actually the area under the curve. Now, what I would like to do right now is I would like to talk about a particular function T is some intermediary point between A and B. So the function f at x, let's assume it's a continuous function. Um, and if I will write this particular integral uh, in the limits from A to T, it actually becomes a function of T, right? So if f, lowercase f function is given, interval A, B is given, then I'll just cut my interval somewhere in between and in this case the area from point A to point T under the curve is actually a function of upper limit T. Okay? Now if we assume that the function is positive by the way then this function f of T is increasing from zero when T coincides with A well the area is equal to zero obviously and then it's growing and growing up to the point when t is equal to b to a full integral from a to b. But it's just an observation, doesn't really matter right now. So let's just consider this function f of t. Now, the first fundamental um, theorem of uh, calculus is the following. Derivative of the function capital F of t, where t is actually an upper limit of this integral, is the same as the function f of t. Well, maybe from the first side it doesn't look obvious, but actually it is, and here is why. Let's just think about what is a derivative um, of t. It's basically a limit uh, of f of t plus delta t minus f of t divided by delta t as delta t goes to zero, right? Now, what is f of t plus delta t? Well, this is the area from a to t plus delta t. So, this is area from this to this. What is the area, what is uh, capital F of t? That's area from a, a, a to this. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is this area. It has the width from t to t plus delta t. So the width is equal to delta t. And it, it has a height equal to, well, this is function f of t, right? 
So it's uh, in this case it's uh, lower case of t. In this case is lower case of f at t plus delta t. But if t is shrinking, then you can obviously assume that the length, uh, the height, excuse me, the height of this uh, rectangle um, can actually be uh, the good measurement to evaluate the area under the curve, right? So area under the curve would be approximately this. Yes, this function is changing from t to, de to, to t plus delta t, but if the function is continuous, then the change is really very, very small. And if delta t is shrinking, as we are assuming here, obviously the difference between the area under the curve and area of this particular rectangle, which is this one, uh, is, meaning, I is really minuscule, right? So whenever you do this difference, which is approximately this, and divided by delta t, you will get only function f of t. So this is basically what uh, is the kind of a geometrical sense of this particular formula. Um, and let me just prove it more or less formally, without resorting to nice pictures especially considering they're not artistically nice anyway. So how can we prove this more or less formally? It, it's just an interesting point actually, right? So let's consider it this way. Um, again, I will use this limit f of t plus delta t minus f of t divided by delta t. Okay, so what is f of t plus delta t? It's integral from a to t plus delta t. f of x dx. What is f of t? That's integral from a to t. f of x dx. Now, um, I hope you remember this particular property of uh, definite integrals. If you have um, a segment from A to C and B is somewhere in between, then integral from A to C can be broken down as a sum of two intervals from A to B and then from B to C. Well, basically it's like if you have certain area, uh, you, you divide it in two different uh, halves and the sum of these two halves is equal to the total area, right? From A to C, this is A to C, this is from A to B, which is this part, and then from B to C, the second part, right? So this is kind of an obvious thing. We did um, uh, present this particular property in the previous lecture. So I will use this in this particular case where my point C would be t plus delta t and my point B would be t. So what does it mean then? Well, it means this. First we go from A to t, then from t from t to t plus delta t, and that's the same as going from a to t plus delta t all the way. From which follows that the difference between these two, this numerator, difference between this and this, it's a difference between this and this, which is equal to It's integral from t to t plus delta t f of x dx. This part. So if this minus this equals to this, right? And that's what exactly we are talking about here. So numerator is this. Now, how can I evaluate this? Now, don't forget that the function f of x is assumed to be continuous, which means on every segment, it has its minimum and it has its maximum, right? So that means 
that integral from t to t plus delta t f of x dx would be less than m times delta t and greater than lowercase m times delta t. Again, that's one of the properties of the integral which we were discussing last, um, during the last lecture when integral of some function on some segment is always um, not greater than maximum of this function on this segment the, uh, multiplied by the length of the segment and greater or equal than minimum multiplied by the length of the segment. Now, which means that my expression, this one, which is basically this, So, what, what do we have right now? We have that this particular expression delta t is cancelling, right? Where capital M is maximum on this particular interval from t to t plus delta t, this one, and lowercase m is minimum. But now, function is continuous, so what happens if my um, length of this interval, if delta t goes to zero? If delta t goes to zero, and the function is continuous, obviously minimum and maximum, they're all coming together into the value of the function at this particular point. So as soon as this point is coming closer and closer to t, well, delta t is going to zero, right? Minimum and maximum on, on this particular segment, <coughs> this particular segment are all going to the value of the function at point t which means that this also will go, right? Remember this uh, from the theory of limits, we had this uh, theorem, um, I, I called it theorem about two policemen and a drunkman, and a drunkard. So this is a drunkard and these are two policemen, and they're going to the same point, he doesn't have any choice but to go to the same point, right? So the limit of this is this, and that's exactly what this is all about. So, what's interesting here, as an important observation, for a um, continuous function f of t, well, we know that there is always integral, right, from this function. Since it's continuous, we have proven that there is an integral, there is an existence and uniqueness of that limit of the sums, right? And we have constructed this, so we know that this thing is, exists. What does it mean? It means that for any continuous function, there is a function derivative of which is equal to our function, which means there is an indefinite integral or antiderivative. So continuous functions always have these indefinite integrals or derivative. Okay, so this is something like the first part of the um, um, fundamental theorem of calculus or the first fundamental uh, theorem of calculus and what it, uh, what it also implies a very very simple calculation well simple not exactly simple but at least at the right approach to calculate integrals and here is how we will do it Okay, so what do we have as a method of calculating integrals? Well, this is what we had as a method. And I even tried to illustrate it in a few different cases. I really went through this partitioning of my 
um, segment into a certain number of parts, then I uh, increased or doubled whatever number of, uh, n number of parts and went to the limit and basically came up with the result. What's that, that's exactly what my integral is from, like, from 1 to 4 of some function y is equal to x squared or whatever else. Now, I would like to suggest you a different approach based on this fundamental theorem of calculus. And here is how. Let's just assume for a second that we know how to find an indefinite integral from f of x. So this is indefinite integral. You see there are no limits here. Or antiderivative as it's sometimes called. So g of x is antiderivative of f of x or in the in indefinite integral. Well, but I know that this is also um, um, antiderivative, right? The indefinite integral. Why? Because it's the derivative is equal to f of t. So I know that g of t is equal to f of t as well. I assume we know it. We don't know this function because it's again it's some integral which we don't know how to calculate, right? But for instance, we do know some kind of indefinite integral. So these two unknown to us function capital F and known to us function G, they both have their derivative equal to the function we know, which is lowercase f. So now let's go back to derivatives. Um, we know that if two functions have the same derivative, then they are differ by a constant, right? Well, if you will subtract this from this, you will see that derivative minus derivative is derivative of their difference, right? Equals to zero, right? F minus F. And if this is zero, if derivative is zero, then the function which we are differentiating is constant. So the difference between f of t and g of t is constant. Can we determine this constant? Actually, yes. And it's very easy to do. Look at it this way. I know that function f of a, if our upper limit is equal to a, it's equal to zero, right? Again, one of the properties of definite integrals. So let's substitute a here. So what do we see? f of a minus g of a is equal to c. Now this is zero, from which we go g of c is equal to minus g of a, right? Okay, fine. So let's just use it this way. <coughs> f of t is equal to g of t plus c. Now c is this, so it's this. And what have we done? Well, we have expressed unknown to us integral in terms of indefinite integral and the antiderivative of function lowercase f. In particular, if t is equal to b, for instance, we have a complete formula. f of b, which is integral from a to b, f of x dx is equal to g of b minus g of a where g is some kind of antiderivative of lowercase f, indefinite integral. So what have we accomplished? We have expressed the definite integral of some function in terms of its indefinite integral. And this is a justification for using the same word integral for, for, for both 
definite and indefinite integrals. So that was basically the reason, because from the surface they seem to be completely unrelated to each other, because what is an indefinite integral? Well, indefinite integral is a function derivative of which is equal to this. What is definite integral? Well, it's some kind of a limit of sums of uh, multiplication of this function times uh, uh, the increment of argument, uh, this big formula, etc. So, this is related to function f just by differentiating, and this thing is expressed as a ra rather complicated definition, and yet they are related using this particular formula, which is called Newton-Leibniz formula. All right, so how people calculate integrals? Well, they are calculated using this formula. They don't do this. I did it in one of the lectures just as a demonstration that we can do it this way, again, in some cases. In most of the cases, people are trying to do it this way. So if this is some kind of a function, let's say it's, I don't know, x squared, right? Then they take the indefinite integral from x squared, which is x cubed divided by 3, and we substitute a and b, and we calculate the result. Very simple. Significantly simpler than if I will do something like this. All right? Okay, but that probably would be some exercise for one of the future lectures. For now, uh, I would like to point out that this is really a fundamental uh, theorem of calculus, probably one of the most important, or the most important, I don't know. And this formula, Newton-Leibniz formula, is basically the most important formula which you have to remember about definite integrals. And that's the relationship be between definite integrals and indefinite integrals or antiderivatives. That's it for today. Thank you very much. And uh, go to this website. I do recommend you to read all the notes for this lecture. Okay? Good luck. <laughs>